Welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I'm your host, Danny Gregory. Now, Sketchbook School is an online art school, but it's actually a lot more than that. For tens of thousands of creative people around the world, Sketchbook School is a chance to start being creative again, to learn to draw and paint, sure, but also to overcome the blocks and obstacles that have held them back. Those are often the most important lessons we can share. What does it mean to be an artist? and how to help you overcome the demons that prevent you from expressing your creativity. Besides classes and workshops, Sketchbook School is also a huge community of creative people. People like you who want to be inspired and to get back to the pure joy of creativity that they once had as children. And who want to support and be supported by people like them. It's a wonderful place and I'm so lucky to be part of it. Now, if you haven't already, sign up for our monthly zine or one of our sample courses or one of our ebooks. They're a great way to start getting past your obstacles and achieving your creative dreams. And please join our online community too, whether it's in a course or on Facebook or Instagram. Being surrounded by friendly, like minded people will transform your creative life and get you to making stuff you'll love every day. In fact, why not use the time that you're listening to this podcast to do a little drawing or a watercolor or, well, anything else that gives you pleasure. You have the right to be an artist, a right you give yourself. This week, I want to get into sin. S-I-N. Sin. Won't you join me? A lot of artists have thought about sin, Paul Cadmus, Brecht, Spencer, Bruegel, Chaucer, and of course the granddaddy, Dante. Sins are fascinating because they're excessive and distorted versions of what makes us human and what makes us good. They get at who we are, flawed, weak, and kind of bad. Are you a sinner? Probably. The Bible tells us we're all born sinners, so what are you going to do? Beg for salvation and hope that you pass judgment at the pearly gates. But creative people have their own version of sin to struggle with. And thinking about the kinds of sins we are prey to can help us to be better and happier artists and people. No judgment, just a little advice to follow. Incidentally, and I, and I say this with all due humility, the original list of seven deadly sins was written by Pope Gregory I. Probably no relation. Greed. Creativity, like songbirds, can be bought and sold But songs sound differently from behind the bars of a gilded cage when sung for a supper. Greed makes artists compromise. They follow trends rather than their heart. They abandon any sense of authenticity in a scramble to fit their efforts to the tastes of others. They measure success in sales rather than in the call of their souls. They agree to distort their work to fit corporate agendas and market demands. Greed turns originality into predictability, into a worthless tin horn. Ironically, greed rusts the very things that make an artist's work valuable in the first place. Greed transforms artists into celebrities, hogging the limelight, addicted to fame, prisoners of their egos, and detached from the pure original source of their creativity. Greed distorts and cripples the true purpose of art, turning the fruits of personal expression into a mere commodity. An artist's heartfelt response to the world shrivels into a rich man's prized asset, garnering shekels at auction and then hidden away. Another coveted diamond in a dragon's jealously guarded hoard. The opposite of greed is generosity. Generosity with your ideas, your experience, your discoveries, your love. Generous artists collaborate. 
They post instructional videos on YouTube. They paint murals in blighted neighborhoods. They teach. They mentor. And the spirit of generosity is a boomerang, opening you to new ideas and opportunities and relationships, turning your art into an invitation to the world, which slowly opens its door. Greed prevents artists from sharing their work with the world, afraid it'll be poached. Rather than joining a creative community, inspiring others, collaborating, teaching, sharing their insights and lessons, greedy artists hide in their studio, scrolling away their work, waiting for the best offer. They refuse to support causes, to contribute their creativity, to reap the benefits of selflessness. Greed clouds perspective, skews values, saps generosity. Greed is a symptom of fear. When you're afraid of being deprived, you hoard possessions against any possible future famine, no matter how remote the possibility. When you're afraid of being passed over and neglected, left to shrivel and die, you hoard attention. Afraid of competition, you crouch on your mountain of toys so no one else can play with them. Afraid of being taken advantage of, you refuse to open the door to others. Afraid of being vulnerable, you amass a pile of any stuff that could be a bulwark or a weapon. You bank your work rather than letting it see the light of day and of possible critique. Greed blocks your way. Generosity and creativity open it wide. Gluttony. Gluttony means consuming way more than you need. And it's a great way for the inner critic, that monkey voice in your head, to distract you from your creative path. Are you an art glutton? Walking through a museum and snapping a picture of each painting you pass and then hurrying on to the next, a treasure trove hoarded in your pocket? Signing up for creative classes hand over fist, but then never bothering to show up and do the work? Why start that painting? when you and your credit card could while away the afternoon at the art supply store. Easier to amass more drying tubes of paint, teetering piles of empty sketchbooks, basket loads of supplies for crafts you don't have the time to master, than to bypass the monkey and get to work. Gluttony means valuing quantity over quality. And we live in times of more, more, more where there's always a new distraction, a new treat popping up on our phones. Why do they call it a Facebook feed, do you think? Because it stuffs our troughs with trivia 24-7. We consume bites instead of being in the moment and appreciating the wonder and beauties around us already. We are gluttonous with our time and yet stingy with it too, wasting it rather than investing in the self-improvement and habits that can bring us the things that will truly satisfy our hungers. Gluttony is a sin of lost control. Like lust, it drives us out of our minds to places we don't recognize in the mirror. We automatically grab for more, more entertainment, more stimulation, more consumption, faster, longer, all of which distracts us from our purpose, our skills, our deepening experience as human beings. We are unable to ignore the buzz in our pockets, the dings on our nightstands. We drool and reach and feast. Creativity is about creating something new, adding to the world of beauty, not just taking and acquiring. Gluttony stems from fear. We are afraid of exposing ourselves, standing naked as we are, afraid of being vulnerable. We cloak ourselves in a thick, protective layer of shopping bags from Abercrombie and Fitch, Marks and Spencers, Windsor and Newton. We need distractions from our true selves, from loneliness, from inadequacy, from being who we are. The solution 
is to make more rather than take more. Pull your excess art supplies off the shelf and give them to your local public school. Turn off all the electronics a day a week and fill your time with songbirds and wind. Unsubscribe from distraction and sign up for a healthy diet of starving artistry. It won't kill you. It'll fill your soul. Pride. In the 21st century, it's more difficult to see pride as a sin. We think of LGBT pride, black pride, national pride, Bono singing in the name of love. Isn't that song about Martin Luther King? Surely he wasn't a sinner. Here's a different take on pride. Actually, let's call it hubris so no one gets confused. Hubris is about insisting on your own greatness. In fact, that's why Lucifer fell from heaven and ended up on the dark side. He insisted that he was greater than the rest of the crew. But Kanye notwithstanding, most creative people seem to have a problem with low self-esteem, not grandiosity. But whereas they would never say that they are better than others, they insist that their work be. They judge their art too harshly, dismissing what they produce with contempt. They demand a higher standard than is reasonable, possible, necessary. They are absolutely intolerant of anything but perfection. It's hero or zero. Whatever misses the mark gets binned. If you can't accept your own normal human weakness, isn't that hubris? If you're completely intolerant of your own mistakes, isn't that vanity? Aren't you saying you can and should be perfect? If it's a sin to judge others that way, why doesn't the same apply to how you look at yourself? If you're unwilling to be vulnerable, you're limited by fear. Overwhelming fear of any form of weakness, of being irrelevant, of being rebuked by others, of falling even slightly below the mark. All that can prevent you from taking chances. If you're so wary of falling on your face that you won't take risks, you will never achieve anything great. No matter how high your standards Do great work, please, and be proud of it. But don't let perfectionist monkey pride stop you from expressing your real human self. Envy. According to Dante's Purgatorio, if you get sent to hell for the sin of envy, demons will sew your eyelids shut with wire. Ouchie. You get this iron mascara treatment because you spent your days on earth getting a kick out of seeing others in pain. Now you just get to look at total blackness and writhe around on a spit. Envy isn't just garden variety green with jealousy, jealousy. It's meaner. Envy means you don't just resent someone else's good fortune. You want to take it away from them. It's not enough to wish you'd made that great painting. You have to rip it out of the frame and jump up and down on it. In other words, you need to become a critic. Envy is another sin born of fear. It begins when you see someone else making something great. Instead of just enjoying it, you feel threatened by it. The monkey whispers in your ear, You could never do that, ever. So you get out your knives. One response to this fear is to dismiss the accomplishment. Eh, the artist was obviously just lucky. Or some sort of con man. She was born into a talented family. He sucked up to the top gallery owners. She had a famous boyfriend. He'll be forgotten in a year. When you are envious, you set yourself back. Instead of learning from greatness, you run from it. You swaddle yourself in hostility. You withhold any kind of generosity or support. You refuse to collaborate. You refuse to learn. You don't see how much work it takes to be successful. 
You don't see how to acquire skills, connections, vision, happiness, all the things you really want. You are so afraid of losing, of failing, of falling behind, of being called out that you lash out and destroy. You sew your own eyes shut with wire. And while the biggest victims of envy are the envious themselves, they can also cause loads of collateral damage along the way. Maybe you've been a victim of someone else's envy. Try to see the critic for the scared, myopic monster he is, and you'll be able to understand what his critique really means and diffuse its impact. Ironically, the classic bio of my favorite painter, Vincent van Gogh, is called Lust for Life. But lust is a sin that has sabotaged loads of great artists. Lust is any sort of intense and uncontrolled desire for sex, food, drugs, money, fame, power, or freshly poured frosty lager. Society loves to depict the artist as a lusty, carnal creature snorting, boozing, copulating, and then self-destructing at 27. Uncontrolled, undisciplined, lust replaces thoughtfulness with raw impulse. You cave into self-destructive abandon. Instead of doing the necessary work, you're distracted. Instead of drawing the model, you drool on her. Lust makes you myopic. It distorts your normal perspective and gives you tunnel vision tuning out everything but the object of your desire. And what you see isn't real. It's a thickly veiled concoction of your fevered mind. Oh, at the heart of sexual lust is a form of depersonalization. Instead of seeing people as human beings, they become sex symbols. Lust for money isn't about acquiring the things you need. It's about the symbolic value of wealth, the illusion that it'll provide security and satisfy all your needs. You want gazillions, you'd probably never spend. Lust for power makes you ruthless, disconnected from the effects of your actions, reduces people to symbols, to pawns on your board. Mwah! Lust turns reality into abstraction turns people into symbols, replaces authentic needs with insatiable hunger. And an artist who can't see or feel or connect is lost. An artist who only deals in symbols can't find her way to truth. Lust is obsessiveness. Lust is abstraction. Lust is infantile, sacrificing your higher goals to your basest weakness. Lust is is lost in the future, a future of quelled desire that may never come, a future you can't control. But creativity requires control, control over your skills, your materials, but most of all, over your vision of the world that you are creating. Perhaps you are slender and celibate and sugar-free and believe lust is a sin that doesn't apply to you. But look deeply and honestly within, and look for those impulses that cloud your objectivity, that distort your actions, and color your perceptions. Really, what about you? Do you lust for perfection, for acknowledgement, for success, for acclaim, for a Windsor Newton Series 7 Kalinsky Sable Pointed Round Number 10 Watercolor Brush with a Seamless Cupro Nickel Ferrule? Yum. Sloth. I've been meaning to make this podcast for a while, but I've been tired. I'm so busy. I feel kind of run down. The U.S. Open was on. It's been raining a lot. I got to listen to all those back episodes of Art for All. The monkey loves a good excuse for not doing what you really oughta and wanna get done. Maybe your small reserve of creative energy is being used up making all those excuses for doing nothing. 
It's easy to tell yourself that you just don't have talent. But the people you admire didn't get to where they are just through some God-given gift or amazing luck. They worked their butts off. They sweated over their sketchbooks, threw away draft after draft, built their networks, filled their wells of inspiration, and tried, failed, tried, failed, tried, failed until their humps were busted, and only then did they become overnight successes. When the Beatles played in Hamburg, they did six 90-minute sets a night. John Lennon said, Every song lasted 20 minutes and had 20 solos in it. That's what improved the playing. Before Picasso sent Les Demoiselles d'Avignon to the framer, he made over 700 sketches and studies in preparation. Gone with the Wind was rejected by 38 publishers. The 39th sold 20 million copies. And Isaac Asimov wrote 500 books and had cool sideburns. Saw we, there's no real shortcut to drawing, best-selling, sergeant peppering, or making a perfect souffle. You gotta break eggs, and you gotta scramble. You have talent, or maybe you don't, whatevs. But don't let excuses, and torpor, and depression, and sorrow keep you from where you want to go. The world needs what you will dream up. Your contribution is anticipated and will be valued. It could seem easier to stay on the couch with a glass of Chardonnay in one hand and a remote in the other until you go to the john and catch sight of yourself in the mirror. Failure may scare you into not trying. Sloth should scare you more. Just do it. the first half of my career in advertising, I would often have irrational feelings of anger during a creative briefing. I would resent being given the assignment. Then I'd be pissed that I had to sit in a conference room with loads of other creative people while the strategists took us through the brief. I simmered with impatience. I would ask critical acerbic questions. I would strain against the deadline. The monkey would tell me that the people briefing us were idiots, that their insights were lame or wrong, that I already knew more than they did about the subject, that it was wrong that we creatives had to compete for the assignment, the playing field wasn't level, that the whole project was a waste of my time, blah, blah, and blah. It was pretty crazy and incomprehensible. With time, I became sufficiently self-aware to identify this pattern and dampen it. But I can still feel the impulse when it comes time to get creative feedback or in the final days before a big presentation, a, a frothing resentment with no legitimate cause. This reaction may be in the minority, but it's not unique to me, alas. I often hired great creative people who would have explosions of rage at the most inappropriate times. What is the fear that drives it? Vulnerability at having to show one's ideas where they might be rejected? Of being misunderstood? Of losing control somehow? Recently, I read of a study in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology that examined the effects of anger on creativity and found that it could actually be helpful to the creative process. Anger provides two benefits, an energy boost in the form of an adrenaline rush, which focuses the mind on the problem at hand, Secondly, anger makes your thinking irrational, which can jolt you out of traditional ways of thinking. In a paroxysm of rage, you may spit out some crazy truth that makes a wild and fruitful association. Another study found that many creative people begin their days with negativity and then shift to positive feelings. By channeling the negative energy into their work, they find sharper focus and productivity. If you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, Try channeling your bad mood into energy to solve a creative problem. But proceed with caution, because anger is still a sin. Its benefits dissipate fairly quickly. And once the red mists blow away, you may find you've alienated potential partners, wasted time and resources, derailed the process, and damaged your reputation. And if people dislike and fear you, they're a lot less likely to be objective about the merit of your ideas. Being a genius 
doesn't excuse being a jerk. So, what is your sin of choice? Feel free to confess it to me with an email to danny at sketchbookschool.com. I will gladly absolve you and encourage you to get back to making good work. Meanwhile, I hope you'll consider signing up for one of the many great courses at sketchbooks.school and please grab one of our ebooks or a zine subscription under free stuff. Oh, and if you really want heavenly time, go to sketchcon.com and join the rest of us sinners in Pasadena, California, November 2nd through 4th. Tickets are going fast, and I'd love to see you there. Well, thanks for joining me for another episode. I hope you did some great work while you listened, and that I provoked a thought or two in your mind. If you enjoyed the program, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app, and leave a generous and benevolent review. Until next time, I'm your defrocked spiritual advisor, Danny Gregory, and this is Art for All. Thank you.